But what are your thoughts on the new infant partials research, if you've looked at it? So the idea is that there's more studies coming out with different exercise, different body parts to say, okay, we focus more on the length and range of a movement for muscular hypertrophy and it's triggered more muscle growth versus just doing the shortened range or full range of motion. There's different mm. studies and it seems to be a bit of a mi mismatch with different body parts, you know, things like that. I mean, do you see this as having any promise in the future or do you think it's just going to be so limited to work out? Excuse me. The issue with such things, using a partial range of motion is that my principle for all training ideas is that so you train, so shall you perform. Now, if performance for you is just having big muscle, well, so be it. That's not necessarily a problem. Say you're a bodybuilder and your sole goal is aesthetically looking the best, biggest, the most um, symmetrical or whatever it is that judges look for in terms of bodybuilders. Fine. I've dealt over throughout my career with athletes who perform a certain thing in their sport. So using a shortened range of motion or a partial range of motion will mean that that athlete is training only in that range of motion. Mm. Ideal. And any crossover for any movement outside of that range is going to, the further away from that range you get, the more that training effect will fall away. Yeah. So that, that athlete may be very, very strong at a certain range, but very, very weak elsewhere, which is going to predispose that athlete to injury, poor performance, problems. So as a trainer of people in the past, mostly, I still say I still do train one or two athletes, but it's really much a thing of the past these days. What have I got? Two or three elite athletes that I still work with on any level. They're all athletes who perform a certain thing, like the mixed martial arts guy I'm talking about. Yeah. needs to be able to perform when he's fighting, which means he needs his whole range of motion, not just a part of it. So we need to train fully through the range, make sure his form is correct in terms of all of that kind of stuff. As opposed to, say, the, to the bodybuilder who really it doesn't matter. They get on stage, they have the biggest biceps. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean that's that's pretty much what, what I've, I can confirm myself. There's a guy, I think his name, I think his name was Pete Sisk and a guy called John Little. Older school trainers, you know, quite intellectual sort of people. Now, they sort of come up with this idea of, like, static contraction training. So the idea wasn't mm -hmm. across the board, everyone does isometrics, hold, you know. It's mm -hmm. more, okay, this person can't do four motion, they're injured, they're elderly. How do we get them to do something? A wall sit, applying press at um, mm -hmm. So I I found that quite active for preventing and mitigating further, further injury. But the prerequisite is, can I recover from it? Now, if it's making me excessively sore because I'm doing an extended set on biceps and my biceps back here and it's fully stretched out and I'm getting really sore, my, my weights aren't tracking up as I'm not progressing or I'm even regressing, then I'll, I'll take the, that out. It's obviously more than what I can recover from. So yeah. do you stand by the same sort of principle as in, are you progressing or not? You know, because people will like to add these things in without measuring the, the protein. You know? yeah. yeah, progression is important. And, and I think that a lot of athletes are too too happy to sit back on a plateau and go, well, I've plateaued now. So now I'm near my peak. Now I just need to maintain being near my peak. Whereas most most athletes don't realize that where they do actually plateau is actually nowhere near their real peak if they actually trained appropriately. The single biggest error in training of any kind for any kind of athlete is in doing vastly too much at an intensity which is not where it ought to be. So if you are plateauing as an athlete, First thing you should do is reduce your volume and increase your intensity. In my book, yeah, I I, I found li honestly linear progression doing that with everyone. Um, mm. I find a lot of the young men will come to me from a background like every oh I do eighty plus sets per week. Um, but as much as I take on board what they've been doing before, because you know if they like doing that, like spend a lot of time in the gym. Fair enough. I might put them on a higher tier of um, training volume over a workload, but I'll scale back the intensity slightly until. I know, okay, they can do three sets with perfect technique. Now let's up it to two, but let's try hard. Let's get a closer proximity to failure, then up it to one. So obviously there's a learn. If I throw someone a, a, a barbell back squat for one set to failure and they're a novice, that's not a good idea. I'm not going to be able to execute it properly. I can't watch them in the gym. I can't give them that program, that training that they need. So in that case, yeah, I start people on slightly more volume and I work down the volume, if anything. Have, have you had the same kind of experience? Yeah. Absolutely. And, yeah. and a lot of the lifting exercise, the most important thing is the form, the technique. And, you know, we've got to get that right first. Mm. So absolutely, while intensity is important, and while the way we moderate intensity mostly in lifting is through the number of 
reps and sets, so fewer sets, fewer reps, more weight. No, it's no good loading someone up with weight who can't do the exercise correctly because they're going to get injured. That makes sense to me. I've got this one last question, which kind of deviates a little bit from I talk about how the repetitions perform. I got sent a X3 bar kit recently from um, Dr. John Drakee, which yeah. is lovely. I did one set of it and I was trashed. Honestly, it was hard work. Yeah. How, how have you found that in your experience? And have you found any pitfalls to it? I mean, the pros, I mean, the cons. I appreciate it's yeah. a home apparatus. It's a good bit of kit. I've used it. Um, Pim doesn't like it. it. It hurts her back. She tries to do the squat thing on it. And I said to her, well, why don't we try a lighter band and see how you go? And then she's like, well, it's too soft at the bottom. It's like, it's nothing. I, I, I can't. It's, it's when Pim decides something's no good, that's it. It's no good. That can, it's yeah. not for her. I've used it. I think it's a great bit of kit. I think it's, it does what it says it does. It's not the answer to everything. John's going to say it is. It's his thing. It's, that's what he marked. But no, I think it's, and John's a, John is a mate. I consider John a mate of mine as well. Nice, nice guy. Yeah. He's, he's a good bloke. Yeah. So, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not trashing the thing, but I'm also not saying this is the absolute answer for everything and you don't need any other kit because you do. It's a, it's a valid part of the kit, I would, I would suggest. The good thing about it is with the variable resistance thing, it does change the dynamics up in such a way as to potentially shock muscles that might otherwise be plateauing into, a, into another phase of growth if it's used correctly. If you're selecting the right resistance band, and if you, like, when you're doing the, resist, the variable resistance training X3 style, Instead of two sets of eight rep, you're doing one set to failure of probably many more rep. The the resistance at the bottom of the range is almost none because of the elastic band. But at the other end, it's very, very much higher. And John is quite convinced that physiologically that changes the stimulus enough that um, muscle hypertrophy occurs. And he's, there's nothing to him wrong on that. So, yeah. I think we can extrapolate from some of the finding with the length of partial research in that case. Like, for example, um, they found it particularly effective for calf muscles, for bicep muscles, you know, movements which body parts which require simple movements to get the job done in a length of path, something which doesn't require much for, you know, lots, lots of simplicity mm. to it. Um, and things like the chest press. I mean, I imagine he's probably taking some notes from Henneman's size principle in terms of like muscle activation, the motor unit requ um, recruitment. Mm. So do you think that plays a large part of it, but there's always going to be that margin or whatever percentage where it just doesn't fulfill that criteria in a repetition strength for resistance curve profile kind of thing? Yeah, I mean, I would, I would like to see an athlete, if they're going to use the variable resistance that mm. they don't abandon the fixed weights altogether. Yeah. I would definitely like to see an athlete using both. So maybe you do two sets of eight with a fixed weight and then you finish off with the elastic band or you do it the other way around mm. to keep your body guessing a bit sort of thing. I mean, you might. You might even say I'm going to do one set of eight with a fixed weight and then I'm going to do the variable resistance so that you're keeping your volume down and your intensity up. It depends what phase of training you're in a bit, whether you're you're in a growth phase or whether you're in a, a hiatus phase where you're just maintaining or, you know, how soon yeah. is the next show, all of that. For sure. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm looking at implementing some home workouts because I'm moving away from my current area soon. Just means I'll have a bit further to get to the gym. And for me, I've got to save all the energy and resources mm -hmm. I can. But yeah, I mean, what I'm going to look at doing is doing some home workouts. So I have... Um, chin up bar, all the band, the X3 bar, sissy squat, back extension, ab crow. So, I do some some home stuff and some body weight stuff. I can, you know, have my, have my spine for you to make me think work basically. Uh, but I need to make work. Um, but then I'm gonna be do, doing some in gym workouts in a proper resistance training setting. So, do you think that would be quite effective? And how would you manage that between maybe like a, a recovery stamp when I do more sets for the home workouts or do less sets. Is it all the same thing? Is if, is volume equated between calisthenics versus resistance mm -hmm. machine? Yeah. Look, I think the principles are the same in that ideally what you're looking for is the minimum effective exposure to exercise in terms of volume, which always means that the intensity needs to be maximized. Mm -hmm. Now, if at home the intensity is less because the kit you've got does not lend itself to the to the top end of your intensity, then you'd be doing a bit more volume at home. Sure, yeah. However, ideally, on any given ideal day, any given ideal training session, 
you want to be closer to top end intensity and minimal exposure to exercise in terms of volume. As close as you can get to that, the better. It's just yeah. with what you've got available and what the needs of the day are and all of that. Now, throw in also the whole complication you've got, obviously, with your spinal issue and all of that stuff that's, I presume, still on the mend because it's going to be several years, I think. It's a long recovery. Yeah. Very carefully micromanage. My whole sessions are, I get in, I don't, I know what you want to do, but how I'm going to do that is on that minute sort of judgment. Yeah, you're going to have to listen to your body. Yeah. You know, it's, it's a tough thing if you've got a program and, you know, the program says we're doing this and the other thing is what I need to achieve on any given day, but your body says, no, Jonathan, mm. that's not what we're doing today. That can be a tough one, kind of, I guess. Yeah, it's um, it's fun in a way. It's like creating my own ever going to experiment. I'm looking forward to training a bit less. I, I love training. This. When I go to the gym, I anticipate it. I, when I'm in there, I'm focused. It gives me some sort of goal, but I'm at the point now where you know, yeah, I completely agree. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm training about four sessions a week at the moment. Some weeks I'm training three. Um, it's just auto-regulating recovery. And, you know, I'm doing, at most, I think doing 20, God, five, 20, 24 sets per week. That includes mm. everything, you know. No, there, there aren't warm ups. Mm. There aren't warm ups in my workout. Some things I'll do two sets. If something's a bit dodgy for me, maybe I'll do a, a warm up set just to feel the motion. But it's not close to it's more just doing a couple of reps, feeling it. Okay, maybe switch the exercise this week. So it's um quite worth. Yeah, I'm, I'm doing it with five to seven sets per session. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. getting the job done. Yeah, love it. Yeah, yeah. I'm guessing that's similar to how you would program a sort of session, you know, three sessions a week, full body, yep. big movements. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Introducing Beef Up Carnival Bodybuilding Bible. 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 The ultimate guide for men and women to lose fat and build muscle. And the best part, Carnivore. it's only $12. Don't miss out on the most detailed resource available. Get your copy now at compositionconsultant.com.